for everyone with an interest in NASH, or more broadly, fatty liver disease, Surf's Up, Season 4, Episode 25 of Surfing the NASH Tsunami. Our coverage of today's NICE guidance on FibroScan for assessing liver fibrosis and cirrhosis outside secondary and specialist care settings starts now. Today on Surfing the Nash Tsunami. This is actually truly a monumental day for people with poor liver health and those with liver disease and for the future. There is no doubt that if we're thinking about early detection and preventative hepatology, there is no doubt that democratizing access to liver fibrosis assessment, taking it out of the hospital, putting it into primary care is exactly what we would want to do. There is a momentum in this country where liver disease is being talked about more. A global community of fatty liver disease stakeholders comes together to explore the most important challenges in diagnosing, treating, and developing medications for patients with fatty liver diseases. Join liver wellness advocate Louise Campbell, pricing and forecasting guru Roger Green, and their guests, hepatology researcher and key opinion leader, Professor William Alazawi, and British Liver Trust Director of Communications and Policy, Vanessa Hebditch, as they discuss today's guidance from NICE on FibroScan for assessing liver fibrosis and cirrhosis, outside secondary and specialist care, on surfing the NASH tsunami. This is an interesting week. We did not do an episode on Monday, as we usually do. But as you know, we're doing this one Wednesday. We, we held back two days because we knew this one nice was when Nice was coming out. And this will publish uh, tomorrow, an International Nash Day. And then tomorrow, we're doing an International Nash Day episode with patient advocates from many countries. And that will come out on Friday. And that'll be our week. We are fortunate today to have with us, let me just, uh, Louise is with us. Jorn's on holiday, but Louise is with us. Louise, exciting day, huh? Oh, monumental. After all the disappointments we've had recently with the FDA, DA. This is actually truly a monumental day for people with poor liver health and those with liver disease and for the future. It's taken a long time to get here, but boy, are we happy. Well, this is this is our third episode on this topic, and the first one was 15 months ago. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. Second, uh, Will Alazawi is with us this evening. Uh, Will, how are you tonight? I'm very well, thank you. I'm very well. Very excited to be talking about this document. Excited to be with you guys as well. So I wonder where the conversation is going to take us. You know, what? It's not going to take us long to find out. And then we are fortunate to have with us Vanessa Hebditch from the British Liver Trust, who's in her first time with the podcast. Vanessa, how are you this evening? Very good. Thank you. And delighted to be here. Exciting day, huh? Very much so. You will find out in the span of the next 25, 30 minutes before we're halfway through the podcast that Vanessa anticipates an exciting week ahead or two weeks ahead as well. So Vanessa, since you've not been with us before, do our listeners a favor. Take a minute or two and tell us about what you do today for a living and the path you've taken here and how you got involved with the liver community. And then after that, I'm going to I have one more question for you, but go ahead. Well, I'm the Director of Communications and Policy at the British Liver Trust. For those who don't know us, we're the largest UK charity for adults with liver disease. We provide information and support for everyone affected. We strive to increase awareness. We campaign for earlier detection and better treatment. We work in partnership to drive up standards of care and encourage more research. And my privileged role has really got three sort of areas. The first one is patient information. So responsible for everything from patient leaflets, fact sheets, through to digital information on the website, videos, animations, patient stories. And we know from patient survey that 90% of patients leave their appointment wanting more information. So our role is to really make sure that the information we provide is, is of a really high quality, it's user-led, it's accessible, and enables people to better understand their condition and empower them. I'm then responsible for the communication side of things, so that's media relations, again, managing the website, the social media, media, newsletters, running campaigns. And then my final area is the policy and public affairs side, where we're really trying to improve care and influence policymakers to just try and make things better for people living with liver disease and liver cancer. And one of the things we do is, is we run the all-party parliamentary group for liver disease and liver cancer. So it's a really big role, but there is never a slow day and really exciting. That's, that's quite a bit, Vanessa. I'm sure it keeps you, I know it keeps you busy because we were talking about this a little bit before you started the podcast. But one thing, I'd love for you to do is if you can share with our listeners um, one thing about you, a hobby, a passion or something else that folks wouldn't expect if you didn't tell them about it. Well, I'm going to divulge to all of you many, many moons ago, and I'm showing my age now. I used to have bright pink hair 
and be a punk rocker. So that's my secret message. Um, what was your best punk rock cover song? Well, I love The Clash and I still love The Clash, but I'm going to say um, something more obscure, which is Goo Goo Muck by The Cramps. Now, that came left field. <laughs> or from across the pond, because I don't... I. I I have uh, had a bunch of punk rockers in the family, and my wife actually was a major uh, Ramones and um, Buster Poindexter fan, and New York Dolls, which is Joe Hansen before Buster Poindexter. But the Cramps have somehow never made their way into any of our music, so I will have to ask her about that later. Louise, I don't think we've had anybody talk about punk rock on this uh, question before, have we? No, but that's taken gold lame shorts out of my mind and take that to repute. You could wear gold lame shorts and pink hair at the same time, and that would really be quite a thing. All right. So with that, and, and thanks, thanks, Vanessa, that was a fantastic introduction. Uh, why don't we just get started? Icebreaker. Other than the obvious, which is what we're here to talk about today, one good thing, personal or professional, that's happened in your life in the last week. Uh, brave one, go first. Oh, I'll jump in. We've just completed signing a contract to provide fiber scan services to a drunk and alcohol hospital, which is good. So they get to have good access for their um, inpatients. So that's a nice small start. Very nice. Very nice. Next. Well, I'm really excited this week. Lots has been going on, but what I've been doing is I've been briefing MPs for the first ever Westminster debate on obesity and fatty liver disease, which is taking place tomorrow. Or you can tune into it. First ever time that parliamentarians will be discussing fatty liver disease, I believe. So I think that's a really exciting step forward and really pleased to have got that to coincide with International National Day. Yes, that's a rich, huge achievement. The recognition that liver disease can come out from the... We don't need to talk about it or let's park it in a dark corner from a public health point of view. I think that's really, really important. I was at the Obesity Health Action Alliance and there was a steady stream of parliamentarians coming in. It's slowly starting to become apparent to parliamentarians that they're going to need to do something about this. Whatever's driving them, whether it's healthcare, whether it's finances, whether it's votes, it doesn't really matter. This is what's going to happen. And, you know, it's the work of you, the British Liver Trust, other organisations that's driven that. So, you know, congratulations on that. Yes. Fabulous. For those of us, Vanessa, who don't live in the UK and don't have the same parliamentary system that you folks do, what is the nature of the debate? Is, the, is it over a resolution or a topic or is it simply informative? What form will this take? So the debate is on obesity and fatty liver disease. And we've got sort of three main areas that we're talking about. We're talking about prevention. So that's all the sort of fiscal measures and, and changes to population health, changing the sort of whole thinking around obesity and getting away from from it as being a disease, but thinking more about how we've created that obesogenic um, environment. And then we've got things about the variation in care that we see across the UK. And then the third sort of key areas that we've got MPs talking about is early detection, which dovetails very nicely into today. Fantastic. So, Will, uh, one good news piece from last week. Last week, I was in the south of France last week. That's the best bit of news. And the slightly less good bit of news is I'm not in the south of France this week. <laughs> there you go. That'll do. That actually would suffice. I totally understand how that works. So I guess my good news is that uh, last weekend I was back in Texas for the first time since um, my kids moved out of there and got to visit with family and see friends and eat Mexican food, which is delicious and absolutely the worst thing for your liver you could imagine, particularly when you wash it down with a lot of beer. But nonetheless, it was, it was, it was a good time and great to check in with people and a lot of fun. And then just for kicks, I can talk a little bit about Tottenham because they're not going Europe, but at least we have a manager. And, and we did that before the end of the transfer window. And we didn't get the first guy we wanted, but we got someone we were willing to make a four-year commitment to, which is not exactly what happened the last time we were in this fix. So this, that's all better. This episode's a bit of a celebration. As I say, it's the third time we've talked about this topic. The first was during the initial public comment period uh, back early in 2022, when Louise suggested that we use an episode to, to address what might have been different ways to look at challenges in the original document and questions to be raised to do that during the public comment period. We did that. And then we came back to it, I guess, last fall, maybe in October, which point in time the decision was delayed, but looking somewhat more promising. And here we are today with the decision and with the guidance. So, uh, Vanessa, I'm going to ask you as the person from the British Liver Trust who drove that piece of the, that very large piece of the boat on this, if there's such a thing as a piece of a boat. Can you take a few minutes and talk a little bit about the history of this process more broadly? Yeah. So the National Institute 
of health and care excellence nice they've got an explicit mandate to include patient and public involvement when they're appraising technology such as fibre scan or any other technology or medicine so as well as looking at all those sort of population based evidence on clinical and cost effectiveness they are required to take on board sort of more experiential evidence from patients when making a decision whether or not to fund something this whole nice process feels like it's been going on on this particular topic fibre scan for an enormous amount of time and what happened was originally they looked at all the evidence and they came back in early 2022 and they decided that there wasn't really enough certainty to recommend it as a clinically effective and cost-saving option for routine use in in primary care and that more more evidence was needed about the relative performance when when fibre scan was used in primary care compared with with secondary care and there weren't enough studies to make that decision. And we obviously were a little bit alarmed about this because we felt that it would be a setback for us in terms of improving early diagnosis, which is a big campaign of the British Liver Trust. And we went about and started the, the appeal process that NICE has to try and give them some other sort of evidence. And I guess we, we, we sort of highlighted a lot of the data talking about why it's so important that we do improve early detection. And then we talked a lot about the patient experience and and the quality of life aspects. And sometimes in NICE, they're very formal committees and they get very involved with looking at the economics, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, when you tell a story and then you suddenly see them start to think about that human impact. One of the stories I told was about someone that I'd just met previously called Hilary Todd. And she was a lady who, she, she took her grandchildren swimming and then she suddenly started started vomiting blood. She was rushed to A&E, diagnosed with advanced NASH, and it was too late for any sort of effective intervention or treatment apart from a liver transplant. And luckily for Hillary, she did get a liver transplant and she's alive to tell the story and helps us and supports us and, and, and tells her story. But we, it was through telling those sorts of stories and also talking about, you know, some of the patient perspective about access. So we know that the average length of time, for example, for people going Going into to get a fibre scan, the hospital is is more than twenty miles, and so it was sort of making you know from from our patient surveys and things like that, sort of making that really clear, and how that having a fibre scan in the community it just makes sense. It's, it reduces the need for those long patient journeys, car parking at hospitals, carers having to take time off work to take people in. So it improves access, but also improves compliance for those patients. We know lots of people with liver disease have got really complex lives and they you know there's lots of do not attend and that sort of thing so having something in the community where it just makes sense for these patients so we put lots of arguments forward like that at the, at the sort of appeal session and wrote things and the other thing I think we did was we brought together the liver community in the UK so we, we managed to get the agreement of our submission from both the British Association for the Study of Liver Disease and also the British Society of Gastroenterology and the British Liver Nurses Association so I think having that combined approach patients and clinicians saying the same thing I hope well, was instrumental in getting them to change their minds I don't know Louise you were really part of it all as well I don't know if you if you've got some other things to add no I, I think that was key a couple of the things that also struck me during it was what nice ask for is obviously evidence but it's only UK based evidence now there are strong cohorts of evidence in small pockets Nottingham Southampton things like that but they're all delivered by specialist areas into the community Community. And I think one of their questions was, would we lose the skill set when you take it out? No, you, we won't. And I think we did because I sat on the expert side. So I wasn't on the committee, but we were reading and advising at the beginning with a set of hepatologists and others involved in that. So we worked really hard to review that evidence quite clinically, but also give the benefit of I've sat on both sides. I do this now for a living in community and from delivering and designing pathways within the NHS for delivery of fibre scans. So it's a different side. I, I've got a foot in both camps, so I can see the both sides and, and look at those arguments. But some of the things that we came across were what the liver community has done. We look at what progression of fibrosis over seven years. So when we look at a time scale, they didn't like the time scale that EchoSense had a one year timeline, were asked to keep it short, then it extended out. So we were, it appeared that you were damned if you did and you were damned if you didn't because of the speed of progression is slow. So therefore, it doesn't fit how they got data. I think they listened and there were some 
very, very good lay members on the committee and some primary care physicians who reassured NICE that this was not about a free-for-all. And this document is not about a free-for-all for every single person coming in currently who could be considered to have poor liver health. It is about referring the main liver pathways for hepatitis B, cirrhosis and fibrosis above the age of 16, and for the NAFL pathway. So it's very, very particular and looking at how we get them into those pathways. But it does free up, I would hope, a lot of secondary care. And I think they did listen and they were able to see that benefit. The costing is difficult because of, there was no specific tariff for Fibroscan. Some, one of the tariffs that's used routinely is ultrasound elastography, which is not the same thing. And it was first reviewed, I think, and this was a sticking point at the beginning, by radiologists. And it's not a radiology procedure that's delivered in radiology. And I think that really threw that beginning process. So that's probably why it took longer to get back to where it really was and where it is. No, I, I agree. I, I think we had to sort of explain that Fibroscan is a really relatively easy test to conduct and it doesn't need to be conducted by imaging specialists at all. Um, you know, healthcare assistants and technicians can be trained to deliver some of this. So I'm going to just, can I just take a slightly different view? So I think there is no doubt that if we're thinking about early detection and preventative hepatology, which is how I like to think of what I do, then there is no doubt that democratising access to liver fibrosis assessment, taking it out of the hospital, putting it into primary care is exactly what we would ought to do. We've demonstrated, I'm, I'm quite impressed that it's not wedded to one particular pathway, that the guidance remains pretty agnostic as to how you might make it work. It certainly speaks to local. I don't think it specifically says local, but it kind of says it needs to be within a care pathway and it leaves it at, at that. So a good thing has happened, there's no doubt, okay? Essentially, we're taking early detection into the community. More people are going to be able to have their fibre scans done. But I don't think we should think that we've demonstrated the evidence to as high a standard as perhaps we might do if we didn't have this situation of a vacuum of any other tests or any other convenient tests to do this. So we essentially, despite all the talk and all the sessions and all the different parallel splinter meetings, we only really have two types of tests. We've got a calculated score and we've got a special score. By and large, that's FIB4 followed by Fibroscan or Nathal fibrosis score followed by ELF's test or something like that. We don't know about the implementability of this. We don't actually have the data to say that it's going to be implemented in exactly the same way in secondary care as it is in primary care. We don't know the accuracy of this test in a different population. We're talking about a test with a very, very different uh, pretest probability in different populations and how's that actually going to be used. We don't know about feasibility. We don't know about acceptability yet. So so I think we need to be very careful. On the one hand, we should absolutely champion the achievement and we should encourage our colleagues in primary care and other non-specialist settings to take up the opportunity to think about liver fibrosis. On the other hand, we should keep our own feet to the fire and continue to strive to develop the right evidence base to confirm or refute the notion that this is what we should be doing. And I remain keen to that that second bit doesn't fall off the radar. I think that's true. And I think the end of the document and certainly a lot of the stress within the meeting was on the fact of collecting the data when this goes out into the out of the secondary care control and specialist care and it's really important part of the recommendations are about maintaining people's ability to scan about monitoring the quality and I think that's not something that is genuinely done in secondary care and we just let people scan there are lots of physicians scanning who probably only do a handful so they're now going to have to come under a design remit for assessment from this documentation to ensure that quality. But we need to collect the data throughout every location that this is performed in. Uh, they need to be committing. But I don't think there's a framework yet for that. And I think that was one of their concerns. And I think that's a reasonable concern, actually, because big decisions are going to be made on this. You know, actually, if you think about it, you've got what you, you know, I think, and I say this to my patients, you know, the fibrous scan is not a substitute for a biopsy. Essentially, I'm flicking the side of your skin. I'm listening to see how quickly or how loudly I can hear what comes back. It's not a measurement of scar tissue. It's a tool. 
It's a surrogate. We are running the Prelude 1 study now. So it's interesting. People say there's no data. Actually, we're collecting the data. We're presenting the first tranche of the data at Easel. So we've gone into 10 GP practices, and we have added the FIB4 score to the diabetes annual review. And based on that, half of the practices are then referring their high-risk patients through to have a fibrous scan in their local hospital, whether it's at the London or in Bristol. And the other half are being scanned in the community. Okay, so they're being scanned in the GP practice. I've got the baseline data that we're going to be presenting, and surprise, surprise, there are very few fib falls being done in diabetic patients in primary care. That's the headline. But what we're waiting to see now is feasibility and acceptability of uptake of that second test, the fibrous scan, comparing primary care with secondary care. One could hypothesize lots of things either way, and I don't want to second guess the data. We're going to get our first tranche analyzed in the next couple of weeks. That won't be in time for easel, possibly ASLD. But that's the sort of evidence you need where you have different, you've got a parallel thing going on, and, and we'll have that data, as I say, in the next few weeks. But there's an awful lot to get right. And actually, as a community, we need to get that right because if we don't get it right then the slight buy that we've been given based on current data will come back to bite us when we go back to ask for the next thing so we've got to get it right moving forward i couldn't agree more but i also do think that there's a balance and i'm a great believer in not letting the perfect get in the way of the good and on the nurse-led helpline at the british liver trust we constantly hear those stories of people who are diagnosed so late as we know collecting evidence doing RCTs, all the rest of it takes such a long time. And we hear from these heartbreaking stories from patients. So if we could get something for the moment that's 80% right, and then be testing and, and getting the data and seeing what, you know, making sure that we are measuring and we are seeing what works and what doesn't work and what the cutoff should be, et cetera, et cetera. That's fantastic. But I don't think we can sit back and not do things because of the devastating impact for those people who are diagnosed so late with cirrhosis. I oh, know. I mean, I don't think anyone suggests that at all. I think it's just important that as a community and people listening to this podcast, it's really important that we have that balance to say it's not right yet. And we see this all the time. New drugs are licensed, new drugs are approved. And we say, look, that's a great advance for the patients. But we don't ever think that we've dealt with it. And the next drug, the better drug is coming along. There's only a handful of medicines where actually something is so good that it stops development in its tracks. The challenge, though, is for the community to take the positive but not to let that inhibit the academic pursuit of finding that better way of doing it. And I think there probably will be better ways of doing it. You know, one of the things we're going to need to look at, for example, and it was, I think, Louise, you mentioned it already, you know, what's the DNA rate going to be? People don't turn up to GP appointments all the time. So we need to capture these things. And, it, and one of the things about NICE, one of the great things about NICE, is because of the rigour, because of the, cam the wide input that goes into it, the patients, the public, the various stakeholders, other countries look to us as well. So other countries countries will look at NICE and they'll say, well, actually, let's implement that in our territory also. So I think as a community here in the UK, we're going to take this, we're going to run with it. We're going to need to collect that data really, really carefully. And that's going to be the work of the early detection SIG, the NAFL SIG, all the Basel groups to get together. And I, you know, we've got this wonderful network. Uh, I don't know, Roger, if you've discussed the Torch Network here in the UK. In fact, I've already broken one of the rules of the Torch Network, and I'll tell you what that is. So the Torch Network is the training in hepatology have got together and they have their own research network where they can run studies across the whole country. The reason I've broken the first rule is that nobody tells the Torch Network what they should be researching on. The trainees originate their questions themselves. But one might suggest that there are certain things that various people could research in this space. So I think we need to do this and we need to do it right. We've been given this wonderful opportunity to use essentially a second tier test in primary care, we should use that opportunity, I think, to, to generate some really useful data. Oh, absolutely agree. And I think the other data I would like to see um, looked at is the endocrine data and the cardiovascular data that comes from changing these people's pathways if we can change their behaviour. One of the things that we all agree on is that a fibre scan is a behavioural change for a lot of people. You can't drop a pebble in the water without making ripples. So by doing the fibre scan test, that is the drop of the pebble. And each ripple out will be something that is change from that one test. Now, whether or not I change getting 92% of everybody we received at Imperial for abnormal liver function test got straight back to primary care. What we want to see in the secondary care location is the right people to see specialists to get that early
early intervention. What we want to keep in primary care are the ones who've got abnormal liver function tests who wouldn't necessarily need to see a consultant hepatologist or an, a, an, a potentially a tier system where you can have a virtual conversation. That's what COVID has enabled to be able to have that dialogue. Are we struck to be able to do that? No, I don't think we are. I don't think we can put the tariffs or the reimbursement in for that yet, but it will be coming. And I think that's key. But I think it's not just the liver data that we need from this. It is the buy-in from our other colleagues. Because if we stop somebody's fatty liver today, their cardiovascular risk drops and their type 2 diabetes risk drop. Does their pre-diabetes status change? Those are the other aspects of what this potential rollout could mean. But we really, really, as William says, we all agree that we need to collect that data. And there is massive amount of ability to research and evidence base now how liver early detection changes chronic disease management by just getting this into primary care. And I think that's right, but we need, to, and I think you, the, the, what you said, as in it might, and so we need to show if it does. I like to start from an agnostic position and say, well, look, we don't really know this yet. And I think this is our opportunity. But, you know, it's more than, I would say that the immediate benefit goes even beyond what you've just said. We're talking about it. It's going to be in Parliament tomorrow. There's a nice document that people will debate. They can agree with it and disagree with it. We can pick over it. But the point is that it exists. And by existing, you get debate. And by debate, you increase awareness. And you can take a pro or a con. You can think this bit's good, that bit's bad. But ultimately, you can't unknow that you could now test for liver fibrosis, both tiers, in primary care. That's the win. So, Will, I think I think that's one win. And, and as an American, I have to tell you, this is an amazing conversation because we talked about this a couple of months ago when we talked about the ICER document on um, beta-colic acid and resmeterone, that ICER, which is the closest thing we have to NICE in the U.S., was put together to help insurers fight against paying for high-cost drugs, right? So instead of being a unified effort to take op- opinions from all stakeholders equally and make a decision that will guide the best medicine possible for the country, it becomes a stakeholder play. So we don't have this. But as I listen, the other thing I'm confident of is wider distribution in of itself creates more data and better answers and more questions. So a simple answer. Louise says you drop a pebble in a pond, right? We know, we believe loosely the pond is something called metabolic disease. But exactly what's the first ripple, the second ripple, the third ripple? Do they all ripple together? Is the pond circular or is it more like a uh, rivulet or stream, if you will? We have strong beliefs about that, right? But, but we don't know. So that, that's one thing. The, the second thing is uh, we had a couple of episodes last fall where um, Stephen Harris and Amaz Nuruddin came on and suggested that FIB4 as a frontline test was not adequate. Uh, they went back to some of the uh, resmeterone trial results and demonstrated how many people were getting missed in clinical trials by using FIB4 as the first screen. Now, FIB4, that's, a, that's an enriched positive population, and FIB4 is appropriate in a minimal positive population, like the main population. But their point was that if they had their preference, the first line test they would be recommending was FAST, you know, fiber scan AST. And and you'll now have the opportunity in the UK to sort some of that out, which no one's had the ability to do yet. So hang on, hang on, hang on. So first of all, this will be what we're talking about, being able to sort this out. I think we need to be very, very clear, and you've touched on it there, Roger. You've got to be very clear as to what your goal is and what your starting population is. I would argue that even Fibroscan itself, which feels like a tool, it's a box, it's used unchangeable because the thing works in the box, even the characteristics of the test are going to be different in people with different types of disease. So the test characteristics are not constant. Moreover, the pretest probability in the different populations is not constant. We need to understand, even before we get to those, what's the best test to use, we need to get to who's going to use it. Is uptake going to be the same in all socioeconomic areas of the country? Is uptake going to be the same in all ethnic groups? Is feasibility going to be the same in one part of the country compared to another part of the country? So I think these are the big sort of geographical questions we need to ask first of all then you've got the issue of accuracy and the question about accuracy is accurate to what when you're talking about a trial population you're really focused on i i want to find f2 f3 with nas four and above that i mean that is a goal that's a really important goal but it's not necessarily the goal of early detection of liver disease where what we're really looking for is people with significant fibrosis we don't really care if there's a balloon hepatocyte there or not Mm -hmm. what we care about is you've got advanced liver disease you need to be in a surveillance program you need to have more enhanced learning pointing towards the british liver trust website etc etc because that's how we prevent the cancer prevent the decompensation okay so enriching for that so we've got to see what our goal is the other thing to say is that by 
by having the fiber scan, we still need to do all the other work. I and mean, it's a tool, it's a platform. You talk about fast, okay? There are no ASTs requested in primary care. Yeah, I'm aware of that. In fact, if one, one of those listeners' this podcast knows that every time I've got non-U.S. guests on, I beat the drum about what can you do to make AST a more requ- an ALT more required tests in primary care. T- totally aware of that. But you're not going to get both. So the idea that you can necessarily um, change all primary care habits all in one go. I think we're, we're a long way away from there. But clearly, having the guidance is our starting point. It's like the starting gun has just been fired. And, if, and yes, we can get through all of these things. And of course, behavior will be changed, as in healthcare behavior will be changed by having a drug. So the, the starting gun has been fired. And all the different rabbits are hopping away from the starting line. And I use rabbits determinedly because human runners all tend to run in the same direction, trying to run more or less at the same pace, if you call it a race. Rabbits don't do that. So uh, tell me, Vanessa, and, and then Louise, and then back to Will, some of the directions in which different rabbits are going to hop away from the starting line, or do you think they're all going to head in the same direction? Is it really more like a race of runners? Well, it'd be nice if we all knew what direction to, we wanted to take. What, what, what I think is important, though, is as we start to diagnose people at an early a point, there will have to be a paradigm shift where general practice does take more responsibility for treating people with early stage disease. So one of the things that we're calling for is that patients with advanced NAFLD need access to weight management services, and that should be in line with the type of interventions that are currently offered to people with type 2 diabetes. So, you know, we need to have that sort of social prescribing type um, options for people to say, actually, and I think if, if GPs had that sort of ability to do that, they'd be more inclined to find it because they'd feel, yes, I can do something about this and I can give my patient this intervention. And if, if I can just jump in, go back to what Louise said, if we also know that this is a driver for behaviour change, then the nihilism around the social prescribing can be changed as well. Yeah, exactly. With the rabbits going in different directions. I said it last week. I said we're also constrained in some respects of the way we think within healthcare. Now, this is a program to deliver. They changed the title from the one that we were reviewing, which was in primary and community care. They suddenly changed the title for the publication, which was outside secondary and specialist care. But ultimately, it's for delivery in primary and non-specialist locations. So district general hospitals who do not have access to fibre scan, lots of other areas that do not have it, more remote locations. I would like to see as rethink the funding. It should not be top down, it should be bottom up because that's where we're putting the change. So the data should be done from the bottom rather than let's go to specialist centres to go out. Let's go and do it properly. We've put it in to primary and secondary care locations. Let's get the team and create an expert division there who can look at how we can implement what they're asking for here, but with the constraints and the controls to ensure quality. I am a CQC regulated independent provider because I do not now work under a label of a trust. Now, every single fibre scan department in an NHS trust should have been listed to the CQC. So this is a regulated process that can be assessed for quality, quality, quality in the way that the CQC regulate any other area of healthcare. So we can have that protection. We fought long and hard to get regulated and we are the only country, as far as I'm aware, that regulate this activity. So there is a risk, but it is also a protection for us and a quality metric for patients and also healthcare professionals to be able to put this in in the right way. All hospitals will have a procedure, a document that was probably written by the senior nurse with the consultant team as to how to put it and they're going to implement it in their department. That's slightly different than how you're going to implement it externally and how you're going to measure the metrics of the people doing these scans. That was something we were very wary about and it is about the quality. It's maintaining the use of that equipment, but also not all equipment is equal. Over a third of machines in this country are probably out of date. They don't have the capability. They don't have modern interfaces. So we're not talking about, and some of those are being used in trials. We do not have an equative fibre scan service throughout the UK that we can say each machine used in each trial is exactly the same as a different one. So William is exactly right. We need to focus in now on the detail.
detail. If we get this right, this is a massive step forward globally for the biggest non-communicable disease as defined by the WHO in people with obesity. Now, I'm very aware that there's going to be, with Vanessa and the BLT team tomorrow, a debate on obesity and NAFLD in the Houses of Parliament. Those are two of the biggest NCDs in the globe. The UK, whether we, we strongly dish it sometimes, but we are taking a lead and stepping up for NASH and every other liver disease by enabling this forward thinking and the 2.3 billion that's been announced by the government's health side to try and get liver diagnostics and awareness in. We do need to congratulate ourselves and our country and the hard work that people have put in to do that for patient advocacy around the world. So, Louise, that was a fantastic transition to where I wanted to go next, which is the 2.3 billion that the NHS is putting in. Vanessa and I talked about this for a couple of minutes in the lead up to the meeting. So, Vanessa, I'm going to turn to you. Take a couple of minutes and talk about how, in your mind, those pieces fit together, since that's those are the things you've been working uh, so intimately on for a long period of time. So, from our point of view, in 2020, we undertook a survey of all of the local primary care commissioning bodies within the UK, and we asked some very simple questions. Did they have a pathway for interpreting abnormal liver blood tests? Did they have a pathway that included an assessment for fibrosis? Did they have anything in place to proactively case find any individuals at high risk? Um, and there was a few other questions as well. And we published the results of that survey in the British Journal of General Practice. What we've since been doing is we've been talking to lots and lots of integrated care boards, which are these bodies for those people outside the UK who are responsible for that local commissioning. And what I hope about today's announcement, because what we hear generally, I'd say nearly all of the conversations are pretty positive. But as we all know, there are barriers to achieving change within the NHS. It can be very difficult to achieve change. And I think what I'm hoping today's announcement will do, together with the announcement that fibre scans will be available in community diagnostic centres, will enable some of those bodies to where there isn't a pathway in place to develop a pathway and give them that ability to do that by using those, you know, the document that's been announced today and the fact that if necessary, they can use the community diagnostic centre to refer in those patients. And I totally get we need to be measuring everything, but we need to have something in place for the early detection of liver disease is better than nothing. When we did the survey last time, only 26% of the UK had an effective commissioned pathway using that criteria that I just mentioned. So, Will, will the presence of the community centres make it easier to do the kind of things that you're envisioning doing next or harder, do you think? And what are going to be the key determinants? So, with all of this, the devil is in the detail. We talked about the ripple. Now let's talk about a vacuum. So I don't think anything happens in a vacuum. Okay. At the other end, what are we actually trying to prevent? Vanessa, you've articulated it better than I can because you've used a patient. Okay. But let me tell you, we're talking about folk coming into hospital, not being looked after on the right wards. We're talking about people coming into hospital, waiting for ITU beds, bleeding, endoscopy services, all the bad stuff that happens to people with liver disease. We haven't got enough, essentially. We don't have enough footprint. We don't have enough of everything to look after all of those people. So my view is that this is going to be a really, really important element of shifting focus onto liver diseases. But for most hospital units, actually, the firefighting is happening at the other end. So we need to be able to work, if you like, from either end. We need to work at the top end. We need to make sure that liver services are able to receive those individuals who unfortunately have fallen through our preventative piece. We also need to work with those same payers those same ICBs to make sure that we can turn the tap off. And that may be in, in ED testing for viral hepatitis. It may be community testing for liver fibrosis in at-risk groups. It could be alcohol assessment in accident emergencies. So all of those things that we do, the reason why this is really important is together with the money, it enables people that are looking after folk with liver disease, with people who are looking after folk with either undiagnosed or at risk of liver disease to talk to each other. And I really think that we need need to look at a new model of funding this service where the ICB, the primary care teams supported by the liver specialists can work together without the intercession of the massive great big hospital networks where the money already goes at the moment. Now that's not the way it works right now. The way it works right now is either all the money goes to the specialists and they do funky specialist stuff or 
the money goes to primary care because they've got to do preventative stuff. Well, I guess what I'm proposing is that in this big bang, in this recognition of liver disease, I think we need to recognize that actually the 1950s model of delivering healthcare probably no longer applies to a 2023, 2030 disease. I don't know what, Louise, Vanessa, you think, but, you know, can we, can we take the big big hospitals out of this and take this to ICBs, primary care and liver folk? I think there's an element of that, absolutely. You hit the nail on the head when you talk about firefightings at the opposite end. You can walk into most gen- district generals. You can certainly walk into all specialist hospitals. And if you had a heart attack, you would get to see a cardiovascular specialist nurse or a heart specialist nurse. You cannot get admitted to any hospital. And that includes a specialist hospital with liver disease and see a hepatology specialist nurse in an outreach ward in your own hospital. And we need to start to create these. Having sat on the NC pod report and listened to the sad stories of people who've die for those reports. The number of times that you could put this down to people who did not recognise encephalopathy or there were issues in late picking up. And these are all healthcare issues that are known in lots of diseases. But I do think we now have to create these posts in hospitals where you have one or two nurses who can help the other nurses detail and prescribe nursing care because it does come down to that and expert physicians. But if you've got good nursing care and good physicians, you will get really good outcomes for patients. So I think there is an opportunity. Some of that education will come at primary care level about early detection. And one of the skill sets that we have, we're all specialist nurses in liver disease. So when we educate a primary care physician about what they're looking for or another hospital, what they're looking for about early detection of liver disease, they pick it up easier. I think Southampton described very, very well how their pathway worked. And it was one of the concerns the NICE committee had because they increased the amount of referrals to secondary care. So therefore they increased their kilopascals to 10 kilopascals referral. But actually what they did do was they got only the right referrals because they'd upskilled their GPs to look at the right people for the disease. Now that is a win-win because they weren't sending the wrong patient or the ones who didn't need to be there. So that is an example of how putting Fibroscan into the community did drive more referrals, but more of the right referrals to get that early intervention to make that real difference. And I think what today does with all of the hard work everybody is put in, it is going to make a real difference, but it will come down to the devil in the details. Some will implement it in a more proactive way. Some will be competitive because the money comes out of secondary specialist care and goes to other areas. So the strengths, weaknesses, obviously threats as well, but there's great opportunity for the British health system to really look at chronic disease management. And this is a great start. So, Will, before you before you answer, I just want to share a very, very off thought. We pride ourselves in this podcast on picking up interesting phraseology. Um, I've always said that God is in the details, not the devil. That getting the details right is exactly what allows the sun to shine. Now, with that said, please go on and talk about where God is in these details, Well, So the question I was going to ask you back, Louise, was... I I mean, I agree. Of course, that'd be amazing, right? So why is it that these disease areas are not getting the support? Because the funding that comes for, let's say, a hospital specialist nurse comes from the hospital. So why is it that hospitals don't prioritize liver CNSs exactly as you're talking about? I totally agree with you. I get diabetes medicines changed any pretty much any day of the week by my DSNs who are brilliant, but not, you're quite right. Am I being a bit optimistic or seeing just the shiny element of the new DICE guidance if I think that by having this guidance I've got a new set of money holders the ICB and I may be able to convince them to start to pay for the liver services am I just being a bit naive I would like to think that it is going to all work out wonderfully but there is a cutthroat fight going on within NHS England they're cutting their staff from 25,000 to 15,000 is what I understand it they went out for a voluntary redundancy and got a thousand so they've got a cut now the power will then shift as we get into that political argument of how many staff are there so i don't know whether or not all of these staff are still going to be there who are going to be processing this and this is one of the problems i successfully presented a business case over 12 months of doing for a hepatology specialist nurse to go around all of the sites when somebody was admitted with liver disease and it got approved at the last week of march for the first week of april we changed division i got a whole new set of leaders 
procedures and it got canned. So I don't know, but the politics of hospitals, I would like to think that we're over that. But I do think we need to be able to do this right. But everybody's job, my, I went through service managers every nine months. And when you say it takes a you with business case, probably a year to get to it, it is a concern about how this money is going to be distributed down. That's the problem. I can go in and put a new fibre scan service into somewhere with skilled staff in a matter of weeks rather than a business case for years. But it, it's a different model. So I would love to think this money is going to be distributed, but I know a lot of people are going to be fighting over having access to it and how they distribute it and where it goes. Now that, if you gave me the money as a ward sister, it would go straight to my patients and their care. Front end, never get it. That's the problem. It's always got to go through these layers. And I, and I think there is NHS England are going through their own structural changes, I've said. The ICBs will certainly have the power, but how many of them really even looked at liver disease before this came out? You can't do integrated care unless you look at liver care. And it wasn't even on the agenda in a lot of the ICBs. So I'm not too sure the right people are on the table, but I think this will push that thinking. What about getting liver champions? Vanessa, in your survey, when you were looking at different uh, primary care pathways, were you able to ask if there was an actual liver champion there? Because I reckon... Yes, you know... we did ask. I was just about to say, we did ask that question. And I can tell you that one in five have got a named person responsible for liver disease. In primary care? Well, when we did the survey, it was just before they, it was with CCGs, clinical commissioning groups, which have now, but we've mapped the data onto the integrated care boards. But that wasn't saying, I'm not saying that was a champion. That was a person, a named person who was has liver disease with their name against it, which we felt was important because if you're trying to drive change and you haven't got a named person to go to, then that makes it really difficult. So we, that's an important question. And I'll be very interested to see whether that's changed. We're, we're actually currently researching surveying at the moment to see how much has changed and we'll be presenting some very early results at Basel I hope, if, if our abstract gets um, accepted. This has been a fantastic conversation. I have different thoughts about what the final question might be, but I guess mine is realistically, given all the constraints and all the opportunities that we're describing here, if these four people got together in 18 months, how would we have progressed? And if 18 months is too short a time window for a lot of progress, how about 18 months after that? Uh, brave one, go first. Give me both an 18 and and a 36-month answer, please. It's a, it's a big question, isn't it? I mean, I believe that we are gaining traction. I believe that there is a momentum in this country where liver disease is being talked about more. Things like the fact that we are, um, and actually part of what's driving that in the UK is actually NHS England's Early Detection of Liver Cancer Programme, which is actually driving work in early detection, which seems quite odd, but by whatever means necessary to get change. So I, if you're asking me, I, I am hopeful that we are we are moving more. I mean, I know, for example, when, since we have seven areas which have changed colour in terms of our map, which from the survey that I've just mentioned, where they have now either introduced a full pathway or a partial pathway since we surveyed. So I think we are seeing change. It's not as fast as I would like, but I do believe that there is change happening. Jeff McIntyre from Global Liberty Institute, who appears with us from time to time, has suggested that at the end of the day, we're all treating liver cancer here. To which my answer has been, well, we're all treating the obesogenic cancers here, and liver is one of them, but hardly the only one. Early detection of liver cancer as a route in makes all the sense in the world, frankly. A tremendous amount of sense. It's not, it's not paradoxical at all, at least the way I have a look at this. Louise will go ahead. I think I'll follow on from Vanessa. We've opened the windows to look into liver health now as part of healthcare in a real way. Can we really grab that and start to put the proper pathways? I don't want it to be immediate in the context of too quick. We need to put the foundations in. I think we need to build it correctly because too often do we do things too rapidly. Half cocked and then it doesn't achieve what we want it to achieve. Will is absolutely correct at the beginning. We need to take the data from this. We need to have a really robust system where we report to. NHS England did it very well, if not overly well, for the hepatitis C process. And I think we can learn lessons from that about how we can all share data and put it into one central source to get the best outcomes. Because we are going to change the world of liver if we get this right in the UK for 
middle and low income countries who will not get the access to the very expensive drugs in the way that we do, who can change life with earlier detection and management of disease because of the things that we can evidence base. It is more than just a UK centric policy. NICE is watched around the world. And if we get this correct, Jeff Lazarus's will wish list to get pathways globally can actually be achieved from this because we can show what can work, but we can also see if we get it right, what doesn't work. And I think in the first 18 months, let's put the foundations into place. Let's get the money into the right areas to allow everybody to have a green spot on the British Liver Trust where they can all get access to fibre scan. And then we can sort out the right people with the right fibre scans and take all of that data. But let's do it in a measured way that ensures the quality of what we're doing. Well, so I'm uh, harking back to, you know, whenever you get a, I'm an academic, right? So when you get a nice big grant and it's brilliant, okay, and you sort of, it's a fall to your knees moment. And then you realize, crikey, I'm going to have to deliver. I'm going to have to do all of that stuff that I said. And that's why I think we should take the win, enjoy the badge, enjoy the recognition and now deliver. So in 18 months time, what I want to see is I would like to see a lot of very, very tired liver professionals because they've done essentially shoe leather hepatology and they've gone out to primary care, they've spoken to their colleagues, they've explained that actually you're allowed to look at your liver disease in your patients, whether it's primary care diabetes uh, assessments like we're doing, whether it's the patients living with psoriasis who also have a fatty liver, etc., etc. So I think we're going to have, in 18 months, we're going to have a lot of very tired people who have gone out and worked really, really hard to convince everybody that assessing for liver disease matters and is feasible. In 36 months' time, what I'm hoping is we, two things will have happened. One, we will have moved away from the liver the paradigm of every single disease is a separate specialty to thinking actually we prevent liver cancer Roger you said decompensated liver disease end stage liver disease and then we work backwards sure we found somebody at risk of liver disease it's their B control that it's their C cure that it's their NAFOLD let's do something about that and the other part of what I think we'll be doing in 36 months time is using that assessment of liver fibrosis to choose a treatment so there will be either you do their diabetes differently or you do the social prescribing differently or maybe one of the new liver specific drugs will be available as well but knowing what the fibrosis level in your patient is will help you choose the medicine off the shelf absolutely I want so no one's going to hold me to those so I can say, well, you what, can I like. say what you like I just want smoke coming out of my fibro scan machines because they're being used so much and what part of the thing is that each machine should do 500 scans well I could do 500 scans in 16 days that's how much work 500 scans is well, well, one of the <laughs> things that I'd just like to echo that, that Will just said, where we see change happening is where secondary care has gone out and engaged with primary care. What's slightly sad about our map, which we've coloured green for where there's a full pathway, amber for where there's a partial pathway, and red for where there's no pathway, is I can look at almost every green bit and go, oh yes, that's John Dillon's work up in Dundee. Oh, yes, that's the Nottingham Scarred Liver Project. And I can point out every green bit and sort of recognise who's led that. But I think what that says to me is those people have achieved change and they are driving change. Yes, we need to evidence-base the different approaches, but they are showing that change can happen. And so we need to look at those people and um, follow their example. So, Vanessa, I'm glad you did that because I wasn't sure how I was going to answer my own question. And I think you just helped me. Okay. Louise used the metaphor of drop a pebble in a pond before to describe the pebble being liver disease and the pond being all the other things that radiate out in the sense that Will described somewhat in his final answer. I'm going to use it differently. The pebble is all your green dots. And what would be great is if over the next 18 months, green radiated more widely in the UK and encouraged the rest of the world to start to understand what was possible so that the UK could then become a larger boulder in a global pond and start to radiate out from there. Now, th that's really my John Lennon imagined moment. Okay. And and I'm sorry, that's nothing to do with punk rock, Vanessa, please forgive me. But yeah, I, th I think you have, uh, going back to where Will started, done cautiously and done appropriately, an opportunity to educate yourselves in the world, really, on what's right. And that would be fantastic. One more thing, Vanessa, uh, tomorrow we're coming back with folks from different countries to talk about what they are actually doing for International Nash Day. Um, and 
we record at 1.30 Eastern Time, Eastern U.S. Time, 7.30 BST. Check your calendar. But if you can join us, I would love to have you with us because I know you're doing fantastic things tomorrow. Uh, well, I would love to come again. Um, and um, we have got some really exciting stuff going on, as I mentioned, the debate in Parliament, but we've been doing lots of media work and things as well. So I'll do my very best and I'll let you know, Roger. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'll be back for our regulars with a business report in the next few minutes. And we'll be back with an episode tomorrow. Will, thank you, Vanessa. Fantastic getting to know you a little bit. Uh, I'll have video. I look forward to meeting you face-to-face -face in Vienna. And Louise, always a pleasure. I'll see you tomorrow. You will see me tomorrow. Good night. Happy National Day for tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye now. And now for the Season 4, Episode 25 Business Report. Slava Ukraini, Chorim Slava, glory to Ukraine, glory to heroes. This week, as you know, we held up recording until Wednesday to await the release of the NICE guidance on FiberScan, which meant we can comment on last night's destruction of the Kahovka Dam, which flooded tens of thousands of people from their homes in Ukraine. While each side blames the other, evidence increasingly points to an internal explosion and Russia controlled the dam. Now, in addition to the displaced people, the explosion may over time threaten the cooling system at the uh, up Russia nuclear power plant, sorry if I butchered that name, and separately, basic drinking water for hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians. By now, it's hard to put anything beyond Russia's capacity for inflicting savagery and civilian casualties, but even by those standards, this is appalling. Slava Ukraini. Ironically, our month of events started with an event we didn't anticipate. Last week, I reported that our June month of events would start with International Nash Day, which is taking place today and we will publish an episode on tomorrow. Shortly thereafter, NICE announced when they would release their guidance on FiberScan, which is Wednesday the 7th, which prompted a slight change in plans and today's release day recording. After tomorrow and Friday's recording of International Nash Day, the rest of the month should go as planned. This two-episode week leaves us with a bunch of weekend conversations. Our current plan is to cut the two episodes we are doing this week into conversations that we will release over the weekend. If we wind up with more than eight total conversations, we may release them over three days, starting Saturday ending Monday. Most or all of this episode will release on Saturday. I'll provide more information on that during an abbreviated business report tomorrow. All those episodes leave no room for a vault this week. With so much content to share over the weekend, it leaves neither time nor space for a Vault episode. The Vault will return next week, along with information about our Easel Congress coverage. And with that, I'm off until tomorrow. Thanks to Louise, Will, and our new friend Vanessa for a great conversation today, and to Jake, Magic Mike, Steve, and Eric for jumping through scheduling hoops to push this episode out the door. Enjoy International Nash Day, however you celebrate. And of course, stay safe, surf on. We'll see you tomorrow on our International Nash Day episode. Bye-bye now. Have any questions for the surfers? You can send them to surfingnash.com and we will answer on the podcast or the website.